Hi, Kristin. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Uh, and I understand you're on the road at the moment. You're driving from New York to DC for screenings of the film that you're the subject of, Lady Valor. Yes. So yeah. we're driving around from the East Coast right now. We were in California last week. Uh, the film is going along pretty well. We're real happy with the, uh, the success, sold out crowds, and uh, a pretty good reception. That's amazing. And it's making its uh, debut on CNN, which is obviously going to bring in even more massive audiences. What are your thoughts? I'm guessing you've probably seen the film a few times now, and obviously you're the subject of it, and there's been some distance between, I guess, completion of the film and now that you're watching it. So what are your thoughts on it? I'm just glad that we're done filming. <laughs> and uh, it turned out really well. I think it, the message is about transgender people that we're just like everybody else, you know, there's not very much different. We just need to, you know, give us a chance. And you'll notice that we don't want anything special. We don't want any handouts. We just want a chance to be equal. We want to give, be given an equal opportunity. That's about it. Right. What's it like? Because you're very honest in the film. Like, it, it, you know, you, there are times when we see you pretty raw and, and you're allowing yourself to be very vulnerable. So I'm really curious to talk to you about those concepts of courage and vulnerability, especially with your background, you know, as, as a SEAL. How, what are your, what are your, how do you define vulnerability and courage? And has that changed since you've retired from the SEALs and, you know, moved into being Kristen? Well, if you... Uh on every movie, every time you see anything in movies or anything else portrayed, you're only seeing the good times. You're only seeing when somebody can be courageous. They edit out all of the other times. Now the CNN crew was here with me for quite a while filming and they filmed my life. After a while you forget about the cameras and you just start living. And so they catch that. And having some of that vulnerability, the SEAL teams, the Australian SAS, all of us, are human beings. We all have good times. We all have bad times. We have strengths. Plus, we have weaknesses at sometimes too. So you just have to accept the fact that we're all human beings. And it's not always like the movies. It's not always a happy ending. Sometimes you have some tough times. Your friends and my family, you know, got me through those hard times. And I'm just glad to be on the other side of that. It's going to be a beautiful journey. And it's nice to have a lot of help along that journey. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting because I don't know if you're aware of the work of um, Brene Brown, who's a researcher in vulnerability, and she actually says that being vulnerable is actually really courageous because most people don't do it. Um, you know, they're kind of they want to shut themselves off and make out like, you know, everything's everything's great. But whereas she says to actually allow yourself to show that is actually a courageous act. Is that something you'd agree with? I totally agree. Wait. It's, uh, you know, when you're having a big party at your house and you hurry up and you clean everything up and you vacuum the carpets and you take care of everything and make it all pretty and everybody comes to the party and your house is so beautiful. But that's an <laughs> everyday thing. To be able to show the fact that we are human beings, we all do have flaws, we all do have the good times and the bad times. To show mm -hmm. some of those flaws and show that I am vulnerable, I do have weaknesses, I have goods and bads, that's just pretty much, you have to show that. Otherwise, it turns into a plastic, you know, a sitcom or just a little movie that shows all the fun times. How about showing some of the real life? And that's what we tried to show in Lady Valor, the film, was that mm -hmm. I am living a real life. I'm not plastic. I don't I'm, – I'm just a regular person, just like everyone else. For sure. And I think that definitely comes across in, in the movie. I think that's one of its strengths is that it doesn't, yeah, just show the glossy stuff. It really – um, you know, shows, like you say, all, all sides. I'm just curious, when you were in the SEAL, like as a SEAL, are you allowed to be vulnerable? I'm just kind of curious how that works with, you know, given the, you know, the stuff that you have to go through. Uh, is that something that you have to push down and you've ha you've been able to express it more now that you've retired or, or not? Well, that is very true. As a SEAL and your Australian SAS, the same thing. There is no vulnerability with those guys. When I'm in uniform, I am Superman. When I'm in my SEAL team thing and I'm going in, you have to be Superman. I have to believe that I'm bulletproof and I can take care of anything that's wrong. And that's the same thing for anyone in the military. You can't go in there thinking that you're weak or you're going to lose every time. So we do work very hard. We practice all the time and we try to become perfect. 
knowing that there is, you know, you make mistakes, but as a SEAL, I was 100% invulnerable. I was bulletproof. Now I'm recovering, able to, you know, to start living my regular life. But never, you know, never be confused with my SEAL team job and what I'm doing right now. As a SEAL team, I had to be Superman. That's our job. Yeah. We had to try to be perfect and, and invincible. That's our job. And so now my job is to try to live a full life and try to be a human being and try to show people who we are as humans and try to bring that connection. So For sure. That, yeah. <laughs> what do you find, I'm just curious, what are the qualities that you have found useful from your SEAL training, from being a SEAL, that you're able to, to utilize now in your new life? Uh, things I learned is that everybody... just broke up. you just broke up there sorry just say that again so things i learned as a seal that i use right now in my current life is the fact that i know people don't always mean to be bad to each other it's not always on purpose things happen and so sometimes you just need some thick skin and you have to give people a break and we do that in the seals it's like we try to give each other leeway and we try to make up for each other if we see some weakness or we see something wrong. So I try to fix, you know, people around me and try to make everyone better. Because if you have a weak link or if you have something wrong, if everyone pitches everyone. and helps out, we can get people over those rough spots. And so that teamwork, the camaraderie helps a lot. And I try to do that with my family, with my friends. Give everybody a break. Help each other out. But you also have to have thick skin. So if somebody is picking on me, I know that maybe they don't really mean it or maybe, maybe they don't understand. And so I give them a break and I also have thick skin and I try to explain to them, you know, what you said was very hurtful. This is how I feel because of what you said. And then give them a chance give them to fix it. And if they don't fix it, then I punch them in the face. <laughs> you have thick skin and you give people a break. And you yeah. try to fix the errors in their ways. You try to explain to them how it makes you feel. And the thing is, especially with younger kids, there's a lot of bullies out there. I'm an adult. I have bullies, people that bully me. Even no matter what you are in life, you're going to run into bullies. So it's just take your time and give the bullies a break, a little bit of break. Tell them how it feels and tell them kind of try to get past Don't get wrapped up about the bully and don't feel so negative on yourself get through that rough time it's going to get better brilliant and we've seen i guess your journey and even just talking to you now from watching the film it sounds like you you you're just kind of developing along the way becoming more and more self-aware and, and resilient which is fantastic um in regards to your family that was actually really quite beautiful i thought the way your dad has um you know evolved even during the two hour um you know, movie, we, we documentary, you know, we see him shift, you know, kind of gradually. And I read your letter that you wrote on um, a, a blog recently, um, a letter to you there. Um, what about the rest of your family? Has there only been any change, any development or update there in regards to how they are reacting to you now? Well, you saw my father kind of learn a lot and I'm giving him the time to grow. If it took me 40 something years to get where I am right now, and then suddenly I spring, this huge secret on everybody, that's brand new. And so you have to give everybody a little bit of time to catch up. So I give everybody a break. My dad was able to do that. He saw it on film. So you see in the beginning, he's a little bit hesitant. It's kind of like really new to him. He's a little shocked. And then he starts getting used to it. Then he understands. So mm -hmm. the rest of my family have done the same thing. And I've seen a lot of by my family. And the letter I wrote from me to my father it was more than that, though. I wrote it on purpose, and I, I put it on the web with the uh, parents of lesbian and gay, the P flag. So right. on purpose, I showed everybody what it was, because there's a lot of parents that struggle with the issue of their child being gay or lesbian or transgender. There's a lot of parents that struggle with this every day. There's a lot of kids that also struggle with this. So I wanted them to kind of see that you do get past it, and you can see some success, see some growth. So that's why I published that letter kind of publicly. Right. My family's kind of caught up and everybody's pretty good right now. And we're all pretty happy. We're a happy family again. 
That's brilliant. What about and your mum? Did I read somewhere that your mum was gradually starting to be more accepting as well? Yeah, my, my mother's come around quite a bit. Brilliant. That's brilliant. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, so just talking about a little bit about, uh, well, maybe I'll touch on the book now. So there's been a book published, The Warrior Princess, and I understand and now that you're you're not really happy with how that represented you. Are you can you say a little bit about that? or? Yeah, I don't really talk about that book. I, uh, I'm distanced myself as far away from that book as possible. And uh, I think it'd be better for me not to mention anything about that book. Okay, because the reason I ask, I know there was something in there about how there were, I think there was one example, I think, and it may have been a composite event where you were watching, you know, some, I think it was Iraqi women or some women in one of the countries where you were and their house was burning down and you you felt very, you know, touched and moved about that. So I guess I'm kind of curious around how you're kind of making peace with some of that stuff that you've, you've done, um, particularly because you're speaking for compassion and peace now. The the fact that anything happened in warfare is just a tragedy. I think that any nation going to war, any nation that has to resort to violence and to war, is a shame. And I see that as a failure failure of our politicians that we have to do that. That we need to work harder and try not to subject a bunch of 19 and 20 year olds and all these kids to go to battle and kill each other. It's just a, it's a crying shame. This is 2014. I think we've grown a little bit as a society. We need to start being better about our politics and about how our nations deal with each other. And yeah, some things happened, and it just—it's too bad that I had to had to be part of that. But if that's what we have to do, and if other nations, you know, come aggressively toward a free nation, that would be America, Australia, England, you know, Canada. There's so many other nations that, you know, we're allies with that I would I would go to war with any one of those countries in a drop of a hat because I know oh. they're the right thing. They're fighting for freedom. They're fighting for liberty. And it's too bad we have to do that. But when we do it, we're doing it for the right things. So I never regret anything I ever did. I was fighting for the right cause and things happen. Yeah. I hope our politicians will, will continue to work hard to prevent war to do everything we can in our power to stop it. But if we have to go, I will go again, because I know we're doing the right thing. Because cool. what do you think about the kind of the, the sort of anti-war activism that's sort of uh, come up now? I'm just curious as a military person, you know, uh, you know how you feel about that, because I, I hear what you're saying. I think it's really great that you're saying that. And I agree with it. it is a failure of our politicians, you know, putting people like yourself in the front line. But I'm curious, how, what do you think about anti-war activism as a, a military person? As, wait one second. We're still on the road. And it's back, like really bad. Okay. Uh, Anti-war activism. I, I'd rather be pro-peace than anti-war. The thing is, a lot of times with anti-war, they don't understand that there are a lot of bad people in the world. We're probably not going to get rid of all war for a very long time. If you look at any children's playground and you look at the sandbox, there's kids in that sandbox that are kicking hand on the other kids. Now, if it wasn't for the going in that sandbox and saying, hey, hold on, and trying to separate those two from kicking sand on each other, we're trying to stop the person who's bullying in that sandbox. And this is kids that are, you know, kindergarten, you know, five years old, six years old. When you see it happen, it's like, that's what happens with nations. You know, sometimes bad things happen and we have to go to war. I don't want to be anti-war. I want to be pro-peace. Sometimes we have to separate the bad from the good. And if that takes us going to war, which is a shame, then we have to do that. I'm pro-peace. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think that we're going to be able to get rid of all war for quite a long time. And you can see it happening around the world. I see people being beheaded from parts of the nations right now. In the Middle East, I saw a, a, atrocities. Now, how can we let that happen? We have to do something to stop that. So if I say that I was anti-war, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not anti-war. I'm pro-peace. I want mm -hmm. peace to happen, but sometimes we have to make peace happen. I have to do it physically by separating the bad from the good. If you're bad, I'm going to find you. I'm going to make you stop. 
I'm pro peace. Okay, that's a good distinction, actually. I think it was Mother Teresa that uh, said they they asked her to go on an anti-war rally or an anti-violent rally, and she said no, but let, I won't. But let me know if you're doing a pro peace one, and I'll come to that. So yeah, it's a nice distinction. Um, just on the terms of. Uh, one of the reasons I actually kind of discovered you, actually, I kind of somehow missed, you know, the book coming out last year was my partner Tracy and I watched G.I. Jane for the first time. And then we kind of, you know, typed in, I wonder if there are women in the, uh, you know, as, as seals. And then that's how we, you know, discovered you. And I thought, oh, I must interview her. Um, so I'm curious, what are your thoughts on it? And I've read there's very mixed, uh, you know, the military is quite divided as, as to whether women should be allowed to train as seals. Not so much that they're not able to cope or, you know, a small amount of them would be able to cope physically or emotionally but it's maybe that the men can't be trusted or there's all kinds of you know issues and reasons so I'm really curious what your take is on that well this conversation that once I once I talk for an hour so the thing is with GI and women in combat or women in the SEALs or special forces or the Australian SAS is a good example just to make it familiar to your folks at home there's a lot of women out there that can do the job. Now, are those women in the military right now, or do they want to join the military? So take all those numbers. Let's say three or four women out of 100 could be SEALs or SAS. Out of those three or four out of the 100, there might only be 10 out of 100 men that can do the same job, right? So out of the 10, maybe only five of the men want to join the military, and maybe only two of those women want to join the military now put them through that one of those women might get maybe none of them out of those five men that we finally got maybe one of those men will make it maybe none of them so if you look at all the numbers is it really worth it right now because we don't have the programs there's just there's just so many things you have to look at right now it's like, i know there's a lot of women out there who can do it and i want them to do it but it just it doesn't make sense to to force it to happen it doesn't make sense to try to make us we want 100 women right now. Well, then what do you have to do? Then you're forcing the subject. Then you're forcing this to happen. Does that happen naturally? Those women that want to join the military, they're going to join. If they have the capability, if they're in shape, if they do this, if they do that, if they meet the current qualifications, the qualifications for the Navy SEALs is you have to run like seven-minute miles, four miles in the sand. You have to do 25 pull-ups. You have to do 80 push-ups in two minutes and then 80 sit-ups in two minutes. You have to do all these physical qualifications. How many women can do that right now? And there is a there is a thing. We're equal, but physically we're not the same. And everybody, you can say, we are equal, but physically we're not all the same. There's a lot of men that can't make it. Now, how many women can do the 25 pull-ups? Like I said, maybe two out of the 100. So you have to find those women that want to do it first, and then you have to start qualifying them and have them meet the current qualifications. I don't want to lower the qualifications. I don't want to lower the standards. All of those standards and all of those qualifications are there for a lot of good reasons. So if you start lowering all those because you don't want to get those two women that are capable, I want to have 20 women. So that doesn't make any sense. I want the two that can make it. I want the two that can meet the qualification and meet the standards right now without changing the standards. Because those two women would be awesome, right? So why can't you? Why can't they? If there are those women available now, why can't they do that now? Because they're just not allowed to do it. Oh, but isn't that the kind of volunteering? And the numbers don't match up. So for me to find those two women, you have to go through a thousand to two thousand other women, and then it overloads the system, and then everything falls apart. So it's a matter of getting everything kind of rolling. You know, more women joining the military, and then a lot of women going into you know, airborne, qualified, and a lot of this. So we start building the numbers and let them, okay. let them have a program. So as we get more into these programs, and then we kind of ramp it up. You can't okay. go to college without passing high school. I can't get my master's, my doctor, or advanced degrees without having my graduate degree from high school and then come Got it. and then yeah. my, and my doctorate. You can't automatically. Yeah. So Got it. start opening up these other programs, and it'll be a process. And so let's open up a few of the other programs first. And I think they are in the American military. The women are in combat. And in the American yeah. military, helicopters, they're going in the airborne school, they're going to a lot of these other schools. So that was the first. That was the first. So now we can have yeah. more programs. 
That's understood. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Do you think they could, if they did get through, if it got to that point then, do you think that they could still, like, how would that play out in reality in the field with men and women together? I don't know. I mean, men and women, these forces right now, men and women, you know, we shop together and we go to the mall together. We do a lot of things together. So we just need to figure it out. And once it starts happening a little bit, then people start realizing that there's a lot of very capable women out there that can do a really good job. And then this, some of those stereotypes will start dropping off. But women are totally capable, and we do a lot of things throughout society that women can do. Women are astronauts. They go to space. Women are deep sea divers. They're in the bottom of the ocean. Uh, women do everything that men do. And there's a lot of men that do a lot of things that women do. So I think yeah. stigma and start understanding that we can be equal, meet the standards, meet the qualifications, and then come on board. What about trans women in terms of, say, someone like yourself? If you could have transitioned or if you'd felt, you know, you, you wanted to come out and transition, would you and could you have stayed as a SEAL? Or would you have wanted to even? I don't know. That's tough question. <laughs> but, uh, uh, let's take that one one step at a time and we're working through that. I think there's still a lot of stigma associated, even in the American military with the lesbian and gay, with the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We're allowing service members, you know, to be in there to serve equally. And there's still some hiccups. There's still some issues that we're working through. And I think the Australian military, the Australian Armed Forces, you guys are doing an amazing job. And I, I, my hat's off to you. You're doing really good. And I think that American Armed Forces can take a lot of lessons from your military to see what you're doing and the implementation, implementation of the policies you have down in Australia. You know, I applaud you, and you're working through a lot of tough situations. And I, I hope the American military follows your example and the example in the United Kingdom. And Canada also has been doing a great job. I think that we need to take a look at that and follow your example. But I would like one step at a time, we're going to get there. And uh, I hope I'm part of that. I hope that I'm invited into the Pentagon again here soon. And uh, maybe we can work out some of these details. Yeah, because I believe you're working with a new group at the moment. Are you called the Military Freedom Group? Yes, it's the yes. Military Freedom Coalition. And uh, we're military a Freedom national, Coalition. international organization. And we're working through some of the issues. Uh, it's a pretty large organization. And uh, we're doing what we can to bring awareness first and then gather the data, get the facts, because I want everything based on facts. No more stereotypes, no myths, and not emotion. Not because it can get very emotional. But so when we get the get the and we get you know in there at a few of the meetings, we might be able to make some things happen. Yeah, because I thought that was really good at the beginning of Lady Valor is there's a whole group of, of trans women that are it been in the military, and I think that was even quite an eye opener for people because they maybe don't even think that that's the case. So I was surprised. I was quite surprised to see there was a, so many in one room that you know were were part of the military. So I think it's yeah, I guess as you say, lifting that lid off and. Yeah, getting breaking down the barriers and the discrimination. So. Wow. But that's the thing is that one person, one, person, one day at a time, if I see something wrong, if I see a civil right being infringed by somebody else through speech or by actions or anything else, if I see something wrong, I'm going to try to fix it. And can you imagine if everybody took it upon themselves when they see mm -hmm. something wrong, they try to fix it? If I see litter on the side of the ground and I see that, and I pick it up and put it in a right, you know, container. I say, hey, there's litter on the ground. I'm going to pick it up and put it away. If everyone did that, we'd have a clean world. If we do that also with speech, if we do that with actions, we start cleaning up. And everybody did that, took it upon themselves to do that. Take care of each other. Help each other out. If you see something wrong, you got to fix it. We'd be living in a beautiful world right now. We wouldn't be worrying about this. Try to help each other out. Yeah, it's great that you're speaking out about this. Um, so just to really to wrap up, um, tell me about your dog, Bo. <laughs> I'm a big animal lover. I think I read somewhere you said he's a rescue dog, but he rescued you. So tell me a bit about Bo. My little dog, Bo, was a rescue <laughs> dog. There was uh, eight dogs in a litter, and someone was raising them to be kind of like fighting dogs and, and pretty oh. mean, and uh, six of them passed away, and uh, we saved two of them. And those people were put in prison because that's just 
wrong. It's an innocent animal, and I, just, I feel the same way. You know, animals are innocent. we got to try to do what we can to try to, you know, help them out. And I feel yeah. like about kids. Kids are innocent. We have to really protect protect our children, protect the animals like that, try to do what we can to just protect each other, you know, especially the innocents. And uh, Bo's helped me out a lot. Bo taught me a lot. So, and he, what did he teach you? He's a little farm. He's, uh, he's uh, eating the chicken down and having a good time. So he's in a really good home right now. Good. What did he teach you? He taught me a lot of pain. Cause I'm not too sorry. You just dropped out. Say again. My little dog Bo taught me a lot of patience. Cause I mean, dogs, it's like having a two year old around forever. <laughs> and so do everything right the first time. So you have to do a little bit of training and, and especially when it comes to, you know, messing up in the house. So he's a, mm -hmm. uh, I had to really work hard with him and, you know, over and over again. And just, it's tough. Cause it's not like being a drug where you say it once and they do it. So you have to be very. <laughs> 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 awesome. And I just finally understand you're writing a book yourself, um, which has got the same title as the film. I'm writing a book, Valor. It's me the true story of my life. And uh, I'm trying to publish that here pretty soon. So right. pretty much finished right now. But I'm going through some of the, you know, publishing, you know, jumping through the hoops and trying to get through the it's a It's a difficult journey writing a book. You would not believe it. So, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> Books out. <so. laughs> That's fantastic. That's great. Well, very much looking forward to um, yeah sharing the word about the film and encourage more and more people to see it. So I'll let you get back to your driving. Thank you so much for taking the time to pull over and have a chat with me tonight.